So I will speak today of actions, votes, and doors. Yes, okay, let's start. So I will present, uh, it will be in three parts mostly. First, we'll have some introduction on the technology of uh, actions, votes, and doors, ABD. Then some stability notions, and then some calculations. And we'll finish with some uh, construction that we have done in Auroville with our techniques. So introduction. So this, uh, of course, we should start with the terminology, topology first and terminology to be able to understand each other. So these are the main types of patches. In fact, you have many, many, top, many, many more types of patches, but these are the most typical ones. I have done a special publication on that. And uh, you have the ashes, and you have the catenary is the shape which is inverted from the arch. So that is a chain which is hung, which is called a catenary. And then the arch has the same shape with the same name. Then you have the walls, which are basically uh, coming from the same name as the ashes. And you have here ground walls, which is intersection of two walls. And then you have the domes, which are we have the same principle, pointed hemispherical from the semicircle, segmental, catenary based on that, and then facet dome, which is intersection of different number of holes, like you have four holes crossing each other here. And then you have different more domes. In fact, you have, you have many questions of domes with hemispherical dome on pendentives. This means the hemisphere here which is on top of the pendentive. Pendentive is a triangular section of a sphere, like this in the corner. And then you have the hemispheric condom on squinches, which is squinch is this kind of triangular uh, cone in the corner. Then a hemisphere on top of it. Then you have the dome on pendentive, which is intersection of the hemisphere with the four planes of the room. It's process of the room, which creates here the pendentive in the corner. And then you have the dome on squinches, which is basically something like this one with the triangular portions for the walls here and finishes totally free spanning. That means without any shape. And then the close, close to dome, which is intersection of two walls. You have one vault of this shape here coming this way, intersector vault coming this way with the same shape. And this gives a dome of this shape. So for the terminology, you have the main name to remember is intrado, the inside shape of the arch, extrado, the extra, outside shape of the arch. Then you have uh, voussoir, which is one masonry unit of the arch, keystone, which is a voussoir at the top. Then you have springer is where the arch starts. This springer is always on both sides of the arch. Springer line is where you have the beginning of the arch with a crossroad. You often you have a crossroad, especially for walls. And then you have the haunch, which is outside of the arch, more or less at what, 30 degrees angle here, which is the weakest part of the arch. And then you can have either a pier, a wall, or a buttress. So this is with the centering. Centering will be the support to build the arch, which can be made of wood in that case, or steel. And it is supported either by uh, some masonry, which will be removed, or with some poles like this. You have always wedges below to support the centering and be able to remove it down. And we have always to build the masonry in a symmetrical way on both sides at the same time. And this is for the, uh, the, the details for the dome on pendentives, which is you have a hemisphere here. We have the plane here, which is cut by four planes, four walls. And then you have always a semicircle here. So this is a pendentive. This angular portion of the sphere here is called pendentive. On top, you have the segmental sphere. So now examples of, um, of arches through the different continents, different types, and different, and different types and different countries. This is a bridge in France built by the Romans in the first century. And this bridge has seen a tremendous flood. In fact, you can see a video after. There was, this is a flood. 
there was uh, in the mountains here, there was a, a big dam which collapsed because of the heavy rain and the river was totally flooded. You see the river was the carrying caravans, trucks, trees, and so on. Uh, let me show the, the song. And this hitting the bridge. And the photo that I took was after this flood. And the bridge did not have any problem. Maybe there was some damage um, you have seen some damage on the side of the bridge on the top. And you can see the houses here collapsing. And the bridge is here. This was maybe damaged by some uh, caravans and trucks and the uh, broken roofs hitting the bridge, but the bridge itself, even the parapet wall, is part, yes, part of the parapet wall was broken here. The water went even above the bridge. But the bridge withstood the flood. So now we see arches in nature. So nature, when there is some erosion in mountains, either by the wind or by the rivers, is the machinery for the, the mountain takes always the shape of a bridge. Like this, we have this in USA, in France, in the Himalayas. Uh, this is a snow bridge created by the river below the, the snow. Then semicircular arches. So always the semicircle with different types of arches. So this is with cob. Cob is a, a stacked earth in Nigeria. The rest are with fabrics in Delphi. This are stone. This is round earth. People have dug a hole into the round earth hole above the lintel and then shapes of course the shape of an arch. And this arch is a uh, out of proportion, this is two meters high, just to give the scale of the ash. You have voussoirs here, which are more or less two meters wide in Spain. Then you have um, uh, swing metal arches, so it means centers here, are, the center for this ash will be somewhere here, coming here. So you have different materials, solid bricks here with some stone little. This is called discharging arch. And you have uh, brick masonry with CSCB. This is fabrics. This is stones again. Then you have uh, flat arches. So you have always voussoirs with an angle like this. You are obliged to have voussoirs with a different angle like this. As well, it's not possible to beat it. Then you have uh, what is called uh, bucket uh, arches. Bucket arches, you have always uh, odd number of centers. You have here three centers, one center for this curve, which is somewhere here. So you will have a curve here based on this center. In the center here, the center will be down here, the below the spring line. And then for this side, the center will be somewhere here. And uh, for example, this one, is a, which is a bridge in France, has multi centers. You have one center somewhere here on the side. This portion here has a center down somewhere here, and the center part has a center far below here. So bucket ashes have always all number of centers, like three, five, seven, nine. And the more centers you have, the more elliptical the ash become. So now pointed ashes. Pointed ashes they have always two centers, like center from the center line. So you have the axis here of the arch. So this is a pointed, which is called equilateral arch, because this is within equilateral triangle. So this dimension is the same as this, same as that. That's why it is within equilateral triangle. That's why this arch is called equilateral arch. And this one, they have different proportions. For suppose this center here has a center somewhere here. This one center somewhere here. And this one, the center for this curve is here. The center for this one is here. And you have many different proportions in the architecture, especially in the meeting tanks in New York. Then different types of arches. You have here a cobble arch in Greece. This is the entrance of the tomb of uh, Atreus, which was the tomb of Agamemnon. So about 2,500 years old. In Spain, a lot of ashes 
based with catenary shape like it was done by Gordy in uh, Barcelona. Rampant Ashore, which are on two levels, start on one level, finish at another one, often used for staircases. This is in, uh, in France, this is in Norway. Cobble ashes, different types of segmental ashes here, combination of uh, cobble ashes and flat ash here. You have really many, many different types of ashes and also playing with the different kind of materials, different proportions of things. Then we go on with another bridge in, in Spain. Very special shape. You see this masonry. This was, in fact, because bridges in that case was used as a toll gate. That means I had a toll on top of the bridge and you had to pay to pass through. That means this masonry here is giving some overload to the ash. And that's why they have this pointed shape here because of this extra weight. I will detail after the catenary matter, which can make you understand a little bit how things work. And then different examples like the Taj Mahal in India, which is what I call combination of bucket ash here and pointed ash. This I call it bucket pointed ash. So you have one center somewhere here for this side, same here, center somewhere here, but this center, in fact, you have five uh, centers here. You have one center, no, you have seven, sorry. You have one center somewhere here, this part, has a center below here, and this part has another center far below here. And then the oldest old that I know, still standing, is uh, in fact there is another one, uh, there is one bigger than that. This is the Ramasan in Egypt, built with Adobe, the St. Radman bricks, which is uh, this century about 3,300 years old. It was built until the 19th dynasty in uh, Egypt, that means more or less 1,300 BC. I took this photo in 2011. So you can have the same view now. And then segmental walls. So this is uh, one of it uh, was it to be for example in India, in Iran, after the earthquake of Bam, you can see here, or was this was collapsed by the earthquake, the front wall that means the cover wall of the building was covered by the earthquake, but not the vault. And in different places, like in Iran, Iran again here. This is LLDST in Uruguay with reinforced masonry system. That means you have four bricks here which are reinforced with concrete. Different types of vaults here in Burkina Faso. Then uh, semicircular vaults in uh, here, Istanbul. Istanbul here in France for a um, monastery. In Iran, after the square of Bam, the wolf was still standing. The wolf was cracked, but not fallen after the square of Bam. And then pointed barrel walls. So barrel walls, because you have the same shape here, which is continuous on the full length of the wall. So pointed because you have, in fact, here you have four centers. You have one center here, Pointer shape here with the center somewhere here, and the same on the other side. This is my room. You have seen some photos yesterday. This is the equilateral vault above our office, which is my living room. Then pointed rib vaults. So pointed the same shape, that means you have always two centers and ribs because you have a rib, which is an ash projected inside the ground vault here, and then the ground vault on top. So I use a lot in the Gothic architecture. And then different types of walls. Maybe the biggest span in the antique times. This is Ktesiphon in Iraq. I don't know if the vault is still standing today. Built in the sixth century with fabrics. It is, uh, you have 21 meters here. It was one of the palace, which was 50 meters long at the time, which partially collapsed. So you have rampart ashes here for a uh, staircase. And different types of walls. This is dugout, this is us the good. It's when you dig something in the ground, you always create the shape of a wall. So this is again, Elijah DST in Uruguay. Reinforced machinery system. You can see the scale of the wall. This is height of a man. So you have what, maybe what? One meter 70 for the height of the man. You have maybe what? 
20 meters high for a span of 20 meters. And the thickness of the vault is only about 11 to 15 centimeters thickness only. Because you have masonry with oil bricks and reinforced with reinforced concrete inside. And this is wooden nave in Asmara, Eritrea, which was built like a nave of a boat, inverted. Then domes, this is gold gubas, the largest dome in India of ancient times. We have a bigger dome than that in India now, I will show it after. So Bijapur was built, as you can see, 1656. It has a diameter inside, it's uh, hemispherical. It has a diameter inside of 37.92 meters diameter. Mm -hmm. Then you have dome signature. This is done by termites in a row. So whatever they built, they always create, you see first their nest has a shape of a dome here inside. And then when they build something, it has always the shape of all four domes, like here. Then wooden domes, this is uh, in a, a very um, simple society like in Somalia, for nomads in Somalia, here also in Somalia. In Brazil, this is a special shape, like the nef of a boat. This was done by sailors. That's why this is the roof of a church, which was built like a boat, but in the reverse position. And this is totally wood inside. So the habit is a roof with wood, like they would have built a boat, but in the reverse position. And this is in France, which was like this at the time. It has been, this dome has been demolished in the Second World War. It was in wood before, like this, but it has been redone with concrete, unfortunately. Then you have hemispherical domes. This is a blue mosque in Asia Sophia, it, which is, if I'm, not, if I'm not wrong, about this is 32 meter diameter on the bottom of the drum here. Hagia Sophia, which has uh, inside diameter of 34 and 35 meters. In fact, it was supposed to be a circle inside, but it's not perfect circle. It is 34 diameter diameter in one direction and 35 in the other one. And this is built in the sixth century in Istanbul. This is a little later in Istanbul. Blue Mosque, yes, sixth century for Asia, Asia Sophia. And then special domes like onion bulbs in India. Then domes on Tomantis, that means you have this intersection of the four planes of the world with the hemisphere. So this is in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, a dome that I built for a project in Saudi Arabia. A building that we did in France in 24 hours with all of those vault and domes. These are some works done by students in, 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 uh, in France, by Crater. Iran has very wonderful uh, different types of domes and walls, like this ones in uh, Bazar of, of Yaz. Then facet the dome. So you have a conical shape here with octagonal shape for the dome. Octagonal shape pointed here. Again, octagonal shape here. This is a bucket a dome, which means bucket section and on facet with eight facets. This is in a robule close to dome. Then different types of wall of domes. This is a conical dome in Africa, domes that you can find in Peru. You can also find this in France. Then domes that you call this is a French name. These domes are built without any formwork. All just, just by eyes. The Mason have developed uh, such a skill that they don't need any framework or any guide to build such a dome. Like the Mexican Masons also, they have developed a special technique to build vault and domes without any framework. And then this is the largest dome in the world built in Mumbai in the recent time. It is 85.15 meter diameter. It has just double in one single shot the largest dome of the world. The largest dome of the world was for a long time in Florence, the dome of Brunelleschi of uh, Santa Maria del Fiora. The dome of Brunelleschi was, I think, 45 meters and something diameter on orthogonal shape, and this is 85 from 50 meter diameter and built without any support. So, this is a uh, photo, this was done by a friend. 
Maheshwama. If you want to can see his website here, but if you can, if you want to see his work, go to our website because I did a special page for his work because he is a very, I would say, uh, very simple and uh, humble man. But it is for me the eighth wonder of the world. So you can see the span here. So the shaping of the interlocking stones, because this was built with stones without any support. Okay, you can see here, we have a lot of scaffoldings for people to stand, but no support for the dome. So that's why they had interlocking stones because they were laid with lamb water and they, were can re they could rest on each other while building the dome. You can see, and the dome was not one single section of a dome. It was, in fact, you had five domes in the same building. I will share to the section. So this is the main dome, which is 85.15 at the bottom. The what's it called auxiliary dome around, which is like a belt of a dome around the main dome. And then random masonry, random masonry for the filling outside here. This is section. It was a segmental dome, 85.50 meter diameter here. And then you have the auxiliary dome, which is like a belt around the main dome. Then you have a catenary dome on top of it, and then a conical shape on top, conical dome. So this was the project just before it was completed. It took about eight years to build the building. Because they had, I don't remember the number of tons, but they have thousands of tons of stone for this building. Because the idea was to build, this was a big Vipassana pagoda, where they had the Vipassana teaching inside. And on top of the dome here, there is relics of Buddha. They call, they call some relics of the Buddha, which we space just here. And this was once it was completed inaugurated by the president of India one year later. So now we see some stability notions to understand how these things can work. So first, forces in ashes, vault and domes. For ashes and vaults, they have the same principle. We have different terms, HG, which is the horizontal truss of the vault or the balance of the second half, because you have cut the ash in two here. If you want it to stand like this, you need to have a force pushing here. That means HT represents the other third trust or the second half of the wall pushing on this one. And then you have LT, which is a line of trust. We'll see after how it is done. And then you have the resultant HT is the same force and here, the weight of the, of the H and then the trust T. And this is for the first half of the H. Then domes, they have the same principle, they have the same. You have HG, horizontal trust, line of trust, weight, trust, but you have two other forces inside, HF, which is a hook force in every ring. That means at every level here, you have a force, which is like a concentric force pushing on each other. And then the peripheral tension, which is the maximum hook force on the bottom. So, so the principle is that LT must remain in the middle set of the ash section on pier. And if you don't have this, if you don't follow this rule, this will cause deformation and collapse. So this is the principle of it. You have here example. We have as a heavy load here on top or disproportionate, disproportionate shape. Then LT becomes tangent. The land of trust here becomes tangent here here and here, the edge will collapse. Solution one, you change the shape to have a catenary shape. And uh, or solution two, to load the edge. So in putting some load on the edge will make it stable. Uh, another case here where you have the edge itself is stable, but not the pier below. Because what is in is this is, should be in the section of the edge and the pier. That means on the masonry below, and this should be also in the foundations below. That means this force LT must always remain in the middle third of the entire masonry from the ash to the walls or the pier and to the foundations. 
So this will collapse because LT goes out of the pier. So solution one, you make wider pier, like a bat rest, or you load the ash again. So if you put some weight here, the force will be more vertical at the end. So I just can have various shapes and sizes, but the learner trust will always follow the shape of an inverted catenary curve. So we have seen that you have the case. This is a, a single arch. The line of trust is represented by this chain. That means the chain takes always the shape of a catenary, which is this one. And you have a higher inverted curve like this one. You hang a chain which is longer. You have the shape, because the shape you have pure uh, compression here because here you have only tension in both cases and when you reverse the shape with exactly the same shape you have only compressions here compression forces which are totally centered in the thickness of the edge so only when you have a, a catenary shape the so line of thrust here is centered into the edge in both cases here so now example of a symmetrical load so now you have this arch, but you want to load it to have a floor on top of it. So you just hang some chains here. So this was the mention of the of the wall. You hang some chains here, which are representing the weight of the masonry filling here. And that means uh, before I go too too fast. So if I have this shape is totally stable because the end of thrust of this chain here is in the middle third of the section of the arch. We see after different expressions for that. Then you have here an asymmetrical load. For whatever reason, you have designed something like this, where you have a wall here coming on the side of the vault and not on the side here. So you have the same principle here with the chain here taking much more vertical, for much more, uh, uh, much more straight line because you have all this weight of the chain here are equivalent to the load of this wall here. And this becomes totally uh, stable. So now influence of the arch thickness on the stability. So you have to follow certain rules for the thicknesses and the span according to the type of arch. So I have here semicircular arch. The condition of, of stability is to have a thickness which must be superior or equal to the span divided by five. Here we have an example of a ratio of a thickness is the span divided by 20. This will collapse because you can see the line of thrust here goes into uh, goes inside of the arch. This is the arch that you had initially. So LT comes inside. Of course, the arch will collapse outside. Solution one, increase the thickness of the edge. You have S upon five for this ratio here. Or load the edge again. So this condition of S upon five is really critical because example, if you want to have, and let's say you want to have, to, you want to have an edge of three meters span. That means one meter 50 here. If you can create an edge of one meter, uh, of three meters span here, this thickness must be 70 centimeters. Okay, no, 60, sorry, 60. So 300, 300 divided by five, the thickness of the arch, which will be minimum to be stable, will be 60 centimeters wide here. That means very heavy masonry. If you have the case of what is called Egyptian arch, Egyptian arch is an arch which has this proportion, which was always used in Egypt at the time. You have a ratio of three here, four here, and five. Then three, three, three here. That means the center for this curve, the center is here for this curve. This curve has a center here. And then the top part has a center here. And for this, you need to have a thickness of uh, the span divided by six. So here we use the name H, but it can be the same for a volt. So now we explain a small, small example of uh, to show something which is against this kind of pool. So you can see here we have an H. We have an H of seven centimeters thickness only. 
76 centimeters span here, and we start to load it. One, two, three, four blocks of the same shape, same size. We put five blocks. And then boom. The, the edge takes some time to react, and then you have it done. So if I draw, if, so if I come back on what I showed before, we said here that we have we should have the thickness of uh, the span divided by five to be stable. In the case of this arch here, we have a ratio which is like this. We have here seven centimeters for 30 centimeters for half of the span, it's been 76 centimeter span. It is too thin, but it stands. Because in that case, you see the line of trust, which is the red line here, is not in the middle third. It is still the, in the arch, but it's not in the arch, in the middle third. That means what it means, the arch will deform. That means when we build the arch, it's quite difficult to see, but after removing the centering, the arch settled a little bit, but it did not, so it is just deformed, but it did not collapse. So no, it's fine, but it is not in the same conditions. So you have this proportion, the, the <laughs> ratio is, uh, hello, yes, okay. The, the ratio here for this nest is a span divided by 10.85. That means logically it should not uh, be stable. That's why when we say the condition of stability LT should be within the middle circle, it's a safe limit, which can ensure to have evenly distributed compression forces into the arch. That means in what we have here, we have over tension here, and over compression here, over compression here, and over compression here. That means tension here, tension here, and tension here. That's why it tends to deform, but it still stands. So when we put extra load, like five blocks on top of it, what will happen now? You see, this was the analysis I did with the funicular study. I had found that we had about 0 0.3 centimeters here, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. That means the line of trust was almost tangent to the three points. And then it collapses. That means the arch will collapse when LT becomes tangent in five points of the arch, or in one point. It means if it, in fact, if it becomes tangent in one point, it will be minimum two with a section of the side, and in fact, five points like this one. One, two, three, four, five for the other side. And then it collapses. That's why if you follow the rule of LT should must be in the middle third of the H section, it will be always safe and stable. So example now we have the same H, so same, same thickness, seven centimeter thickness, seven six centimeter span. I draw here the line of truss that I, in fact, this line of truss is uh, before putting the load. You can remember this one. So this what this what I drawn with the funicular study, which is more or less what I have drawn on this arch here. Okay, and then we put a lot of load, but yes, it's still resisting. Before it crushed after five blocks, and here we have twenty four blocks. Why? Because we have mortar here. Every block has mortar in between. On the previous arch here. We had stones. We did not put mortar, but just on like a dry ash, which has which was wedged with stones here to keep the shape. So now I can I come back here. So the mortar holds the ash, it gives more stability. And this is an act of safety. That means whenever whenever we do some calculations for ashes volt on those, we never take it into account the mortar, because this the mortar will give some strength. That we always consider that we built a natural vault or a dome, like if it was with high stones, with just wedges of stones to hold the shape. So 
So now we see uh, stability, uh, stability calculations first with the catenary method, because we have seen that we have, when you have the catenary shape, you have a correlation between the tensile stress in a chain and the comp compressive stress in the arch, LT. So this we have done, we have seen that already. So this shape is in tension, reverse the shape, you have compression. And this LT is always centered into the thickness of the arch here. If you have a catenary, uh, in fact, catenary has always a special shape. And if you don't want this shape, you have to load the main chain with different loads, like this one here. So I want something more wrong. Then I will load the chain with different chains like this, which will re represent some weights. And this will give me a new curve, which will be a modified catenary, which is in fact called funicular shape. This is called the funicular shape. When you load the chain like this, this is a catenary. You load the chain with different weights, then you get a funicular shape. And these forces will be calculated with the funicular method. And Gordid used a lot of this method with the catenary for his designs, for his studies, for his buildings. He used also columns and piers with different angles. Like this, this is uh, the, the church of the Colonia Guel in, in Barcelona, in Spain. So this was only the crypt of the church. In fact, he died before he could finish the church. You can see, of course, there is a perspective here on the, on the photo, but these pillars are with an angle. They are not vertical. They have all different angles because these angles, they follow the thrust of this arch here. On this study, you can see what you have seen before was this. This photo, this height here, is this one. And this was the study that he did for this church. It was using some small ropes with some load of, uh, with some small bags of sand to represent the load. First, I don't know how we could manage to calculate the load of the church because first it was all done by hand at that time, not calculated at that time. And uh, what is, uh, and that, this is why you see his genius because you have to get the bottom part of the building, that means this one, sorry, stable at that stage. And it has to be stable when you build the top of the church. I cannot detail more than this because I need one, one full session for that, but we don't have the time here now. And this is different examples from him. This is a Sagada Familia that he's very well known for. And again, you have angles for the columns, which were given by the angle of the truss of the walls here. And then the towers, uh, attic of the Casa Baggio in Barcelona. So now we, see, now we see the method. We'll just detail it a little bit. You have to draw first the curve on the tracing paper. Then you reverse the shape and you hang a chain like this. And then you will load it with different loads to have a modified curve. So I will just give the principle. I cannot explain too much. I don't have so much time in this session. So you define the machinery with vertical loads. So this you have obtained by a random exercise. Just hang some chain to get your, L, your main chain to the section that you want to have. And then you have to translate this weights into masonry. So, and you will get, if I have a direct translation of this weight, I will get this. Of course, I cannot do that. That's why this is not realistic. And what you do is to have something like this. So this is the same uh, translation because here, instead of having vertical weights here, I will have a different thickness. That means all this weight, you, of course, you have to make some calculation in between to get from this weight of chains what is the thickness of the masonry, but you can get that. And this can be built. And we have developed an uh, optimization method which can calculate all that. So now we see the funicular forces, the funicular method you have here 
to draw half of the arch, yeah? And then you have to draw, uh, I will explain a little bit how it is done. You have to divide into two, two divide the arch into equal segments like this. And then you have to enter HT, the line of thrust, which is horizontal here. It comes here. It encounters the first weight of the first voussoir, which is here. And then it will have a different angle. And then encounters the second weight. It gets this angle. That in fact, you have two red diagrams. One is called here the force diagram, which is just lines which symbolize the different forces, and then these forces onto the arch. And this is called the form diagram. And then this uh, force can counter the weld W2 here. It gets this angle, and this angle, I will put it here. And counter W3, it changes angle from here to here, which is here. And this angle, I will put it here. And then slowly, you can define your first uh, LT prime line, because this will not be, no, sorry, this is the final resultant. Because in fact, there is a step in between. That's why you have T prime here and T here. So this will be the final resultant of the thrust into the arch. And you can see here, LT is not in the arch itself, but this arch will collapse because it is not stable and not safe. It is possible to make this such stable if you optimize it. We will see after how it is. So now we see the optimized uh, method that you have developed, which is a combination of the Gaudi method with uh, the Scatterini method and the Finicula method. What we, what we try to do here, what we try to do here is to have the lightest as, pos lightest as possible with an anatrose in the middle third of the arch. Because if you have a very large arch, the truss will be the minimum. So you draw again your catenary metal like this, hang all the weights. And then you have, of course, some calculation of go very fast because you have a full method for that. I need one section only for the method. So we have here this weight converted into different thickness of masonry. And at the end, we'll have the final method like this. And that means we have to see what we have done before with LT entering here. And now you have different thicknesses for the top boussoir and bigger thickness on the bottom boussoir. And this is a bigger scale. And I did not draw here the three thirds of the thickness to have easier drawing, but if you see the, the middle third, this is always in the middle third, you have one third here and two thirds here. And this is totally stable and safe. And limit of stability is up to where you can build with other other courses. You, can, you have seen here, this is a masonry pattern. You have block which are laid, I would say, radially to the center, but in length, they are horizontal. And then the blocks are laid vertically. And you will see after some photos of how we built it. So this will be like this. So all this one, in fact, all this is built for the tennis form work. We will see after how it is done with photos. So these ones are radial to the center, but laid horizontally in the length of the walls like this, in the depth of the walls, and these points are laid vertically, this means like this, always in vertical sections. And this will be after the masonry details for the masons to build it. Examples now for a catenary study for um, a collateral wall. So now the funicular study and the masonry pattern. So this is a section for the living room of my uh, room, of my house. Then an uh, example of a catenary study for the Egyptian shed world, catenary study, funicular study, and masonry study, masonry pattern. So now we're seeing um, 
which is the case of the Sharanov conference hall, which is 15 meters, 15 meters uh, span, so maximum span 15 meters. We have done the study for the funicular vault alone. That means we study the vault alone first. Yeah, of course, it must be stable and safe. Then you have to study the load with the lav load. If you have, uh, a, imagine a lot of people climbing on it or uh, some wind pressure also. So this will be with the lav load. In the case, the vault should be, this will be with a overload and lav load. This waterproofing load here with lav load. And of course, LT must remain in the middle third of the vault itself. And then we have to do also uh, asymmetrical loading for wind pressure. In, the, in all the cases, LT must remain in the middle third of the thickness of the vault. So now we see the case for optimized experimental vault for flowing. This is for multi flows. So you have here a vault with the two different thicknesses. It must be always stable for the vault alone, like here. Then for the vault plus overload plus lab load, it must be stable. And this is how it is built. So you have here two different thicknesses, 11.5 here and nine centimeter thickness here. And then you have a support wall here, another support wall, stone slabs here to create a cavity below here and here. And you have the hot air of the room goes into this cavity. From this cavity, it goes into the second one and then it goes to the roof or go to the facade. As we send this hall to the roof or to the facade to have some natural ventilation into the building. That means you have a very large structure with a very uh, good ventilation of the building. Like this. So here we build the vault itself. You have a template here to keep the shape of the vault. We have string lines in between. Then we build the partition walls with the stone slab. In that case, we had the hole here on the front facade inside the building and on the outside facade. So now we have examples of Vika's apartment. You have seen yesterday some photos of the building on four floors. So everywhere we have vault and domes for this building on the four floors with cavities here. So you have a, a pipe here for the hot air to go in the cavity. And this was pulled in the solar chimney on the top of the building. So now we see examples of um, buildings with actual vault and domes. This is again Vicas on four floors. Every apartment has a dome for the living room here and a vault for the bedrooms here. Yeah. So this is uh, from the garden side, vaults for the bedroom. You have ferrocement channels for the terraces here. And inside you have a square dome. So this is relation apartments on three floors. Again, vault on the top. Uh, sometimes uh, vault for the bedrooms here or a dome. This was with a dome inside, and or this was with a vault. Yeah. So now uh, evolution of the uh, of the trust for domes. So domes they have different behavior from walls. So we have to see that. So the stability for the square domes is generated like a study of an ash of the original shape of the world. If you have a circular dome, it will be created by the rotation of an ash around the vertical axis. And this creates hook forces. And our method cannot calculate yet hook forces. So this requires a different approach for the stability of the domes. So built, domes built of all, all over the world since long time they have a very wide varieties of shapes, than, in fact, wider, than, wider shapes than domes. Examples, you have this conical shape, facet dome here in Turkey, conical dome in Arbor Coast, the stand. But if you build the ash of the same section, it will collapse. That means this shows that if a dome of this section stands, a ash or a vault of the same section cannot stand. That means domes are more stable than vaults on dome, than ashes on the vault, sorry. 
That's why if this is standing, the arch will not stand. So what we say is we study the dome like an arch. And when we get a section for the arch stable, if we take the same shape for the dome, the dome will be always stable. And this is very safe condition. And we know that it will be very safe, but the dome can be optimized like we do for the walls with our method. So now we have how to neutralize the thrust in the ashes in a wall. So you have here a small arch in the center, no problem. Then you have an arch in a corner. The thrust on this side will be critical because the thrust goes out of the wall. So solution one, you have a more round shape for the arch to have a thrust more vertical on the bottom of the wall, or you move the way you move away the arch from the corner. You have now a large arch, which has here the case of the line of thrust coming out of the pier. It will collapse. Solution one, you change the roof, because if I remove this roof, I remove the weight here. That means the force will be more vertical. And also, I put this weight here, which brings the force more vertical. So solution one or solution two, keep the same shape for the roof, but condense the buttress behind. So now forces act on the beam. The walls rest on the beam, which spans an opening. You have the forces here. You have the walls here resting on the, this is a spring beam on the window, for example. You have vertical weight of the hole and the little truss here. Then you have to consider the span in two directions, like I said, weight and truss here. Then you have the case of a vault with a spring beam on the wall. You just have to integrate only the thrust, or the thrust of the vault, like this here. So now a way to increase the inertia of the beam, because you see here, often you don't have enough width. The spring is often not wide enough for the thrust that you have. So often you can do some kind of tricks like this. You create a kind of rainwater gutter behind. This means here I will have a wider pier. And by doing so, I can increase the inertia of the beam. This means minimize the amount of steel in the whole beam. And I will use this for a rainwater gutter. So now we have to see the bending moments applied on the ring beam or speaker beam. These are the main types of bending moments you can get. So you have the case of a simply supported case when you have a beam on the walls. This is a spinger beam with fixed support. This will be a square room for a dome, for example. This will be a vault with two truss rod with inverted moments like this, and then a multi case with two tie rods here, truss rod and square shape for the room. So now you have to add a tie rod sometimes to balance the thrust of the world. This is a formula to calculate the force in the tie rod or truss rod. So you have this, you have to take in account of course the strength of the steel. This is for India. And we should not have too much elongation because you should not have more than five mm elongation as well as the burning moment will change. So we have to pay a lot of attention to the anchorage of the tie rod into the beam, because you have a lot of force. In fact, you see, when you have a tie rod like this, you have to anchor it into the beam. You have to pull it like this from the beam. From the beam. And of course, I don't want to have the tie rod coming out of the beam. So you have to see different possibilities, because often you don't have enough embedment for the steel rod into the beam. Examples now. This was a request for a small vault, which was a 3 meter 60 centimeter span only. But it had a pressure of almost uh, 3 tons per, per meter, a thrust of 3 tons per meter. So we had to do this because for such a thrust here, I would have had about 1 meter embedment for this beam. This means 1 meter wide springer beam. But I had only this width for the spring beam. So the thing that I did was to have 
uh, piece of steel welded on the main bar here. This was hooked behind the stirrup here. Then you have, we bend the main bar here up to have this part of the truss rod pressing compression against the beam. And then we'll weld some angle bars behind like this on both sides, which was hooked behind the stirrup. It means to pull the entire beam with a stirrup. With a, and then you have another case. This was a case of a dependent wall of 10.35 meter span. I used here a combination of uh, encouraged by embedment and by uh, compression. So he, this construction of the beam, this is a bit difficult to explain by uh, online, but I will try to do it. So basically we had the section of the beam. This was the wall on which it was running. This was the width of the pier. And what we did was to have a hole left to the thickness of the beam with a hole here for the ventilation to cast concrete. Then we inserted the tie rod here, which was with the thread at the end we had a, a bolted part here. So the principle was to put the concrete in compression because I asked an engineer to tell me what was the embedment required for this truss here because we had five tons of truss to a tie rod. And he asked me to put an embedment of 120 here. But the problem was that the pier was only at 6.5 meters. That means it could not work. So what I did was to use compression forces because I put this concrete here in compression with the bolt which was fixed in the end here. And then we cast after some expanding rod into the hole here to have friction. That means to have embedment. That means it had embedment and about 70 centimeters long for this steel and then compression to put this part of the beam in compression. And the vault is there since 1995 and had no problem at all. So now we see square domes. Square, square domes are quite easy because they have the same force as a vault. But for the circular domes, you have to take in account the hook forces and the peripheral tension. So we can say that uh, a dome is like infinite number of center of arches, right? Uh, a, a circular dome, sorry, is like infinite number of arches, which are radiating from the center of the dome. And this creates uh, peripheral tension, which is maximum hook force into the dome. And this is the formula to calculate it. Then uh, I will go a little faster here because I'm getting late and Omar will not be so happy. So acoustic in domes and walls, they have uh, a difficult acoustic called echo and reverberation. So these domes, they are especially the domes which are on a portion of a sphere like a hemisphere. They have a very strong uh, echo due to their shape. Reverberation will be the time needed for the sound to fade away which is related to the volume of the vault of the dome and the shape of the structure and the materials. So in order to reduce these acoustic problems, and yes, in fact, hemispheric domes, they have the strongest echo. Photodomes have a very echo, but they have reverberation and they can amplify the sound. And the dome which are generated by your vault, like a close to dome or grand dome, they don't have any echo because they behave like a vault. So this acoustic problem, uh, acoustic characteristic can be resolved by what you call a uh, Helmholtz resonator or single resonator absorbers. Principle is that you have a cavity like this. Uh, you have the, the room here. In the masonry of the vault or the dome, you have a neck with a cavity behind. You can have a single tube. And there are some formulas, of, of course, to calculate the dimensions of this or the dimensions of that. And this can absorb the sound. And then neutralize the echo and the reverberation. And this is called by absorbed by viscous loss. I cannot detail it more. We don't have enough time now. I'm sorry. So now we see how to build AVD with our techniques.
So these are examples of in Auroville. This is from uh, uh, Hassan Fati in Egypt. So we built a notch first on the centering. So first we have to adjust the centering. Then we built with the mortar here with the regular portion on the on the voussoir. We check with the rectangle to be a square to be really parallel and rectangle to the framework. And then we fill the top with the mortar, which is slatted higher. Then we have Egyptian shaped wall. We have first a gable wall at the end here yeah, to give the shape. Then we put string lines in between the gable wall and the window frame in front. And then we build with ashes which are vertically laid. So we soak the block in water first, apply some water, which is very liquid, like a glue, and then stick the block on top of the previous course, like this. And you have always to build the bolt symmetrically, that means the uh, same speed on the other side to be balanced. And this was built in uh, 12 days with four masons. We have here a catenary shape, and in fact, a funicular shape, which is 17.7 .7 and 14 here. And this was uh, afterwards we developed a cantilevered part later. This is our training center in Orovi. Then we built a catenary vault for the kitchen of the trainees. We have here the window frame, which is uh, which will be removed uh, after some time and put back at the end. We built here with, with steps because we have a vault of six meters span here, and the blocks are only five centimeter wide here. That means we have to build some steps to have some stability laterally. Then we close the facade above the window. And after some time, when you had enough width here for the for the ash, I removed the window frame because it is, was difficult for the workers to work. Because we need to have enough stability laterally before we remove the framework. And then we run with fresh panic technique. So here we have a bull eye, which is prepared with some rods here in process here. So we just have a circle outside, circle inside with some string lines in between to follow the shape of the cylinder. We built some keys inside to hold the bullseye with the masonry above. And this is done in two days. Then we built a lunette. A lunette is a small vault crossing the main vault. So we have a template here to give the shape with a catenary shape. Blocks are horizontally laid with the cobbling system. We put a key here above the blocks, put the keystone, and this is built in three days. That's only the, uh, the unit. Then the signal vault of Dipanam of 10.75 meters. We start with the squinch first. We have a template here, give the shape of the triangular piece of the wall, string lines in between, 10.75 meters span here for the template here, which, which was the window of the building. So we put the string lines in between. After we finishing the squinch here, the template is moved in front. So you have six meters here. 10.35 meters span here. <coughs> At the end, we remove the window frame and we finish totally without anything. And take a photo. The wall was built in three weeks, about 30 tons, built with four masons. Then you have the dome on Ponantives. You have the fluidity of the glue. Plane of the block. This is acoustic writer. The domain progress built in uh, five days with one mason. This is the dome on finish. This is one of the room of our office. You can see the acoustic writers here. Then a dome on screenshots. Five close to the dome on screenshots. We have here the template to give the shape of the dome. So this is an elliptical shape here. 
we, see, we put a small wedge of a stone chip here to balance because we need to have a contact on the intrado of the block and intra, extrado of the block. We cut a keystone here in the center. And this type of dome is built in six days with formation. This is a bit slower because you have a lot of cutting of blocks in the corners. Then the collateral vault, which is my living room. You have here the window frame. In the back, you have a pipe here bent for the shape of the half dome. We built with horizontal courses first, like this, a bit horizontally in the length of the vault. We put here a fluorescent ring for the window. And now we build by steps. So we stop when it was still horizontal, but we build by steps now for stability reason when we build. Then we put the first keystones. So we have the mason preparing the keystone here. The lunette, which is cobbling inside. Then finishing the vault, we remove the window frame and finish with the straight edge here. Built in, uh, uh, yes, this was built in 36 days. This is my living room. So now see, we see the same shape now, but uh, a ground vault. So the same equilateral shape, but ground vault means two walls crushing each other here with the ground in the center. This is the pipes here for the ground inside an equilateral shape for the wall. So we have here the window frames again, which keeps the shape of the wall. We put string lines now from the window frame to the ground here. When we pull them step by step, like this. Then after some time, we build these vertical courses. So the box are laid now vertically like this. We put the lunettes on top of it, like it was for my world. And then we progress slowly with the uh, horizontal courses built by steps like this. You can see they're always done by steps here. Then we have a special bond pattern for the masonry to stand. I cannot explain too much. We don't have time, I'm sorry. I'm really late for Omar. So you can always join our course or see our website because we have case studies for these works in the website. And then we close slowly the vault at the top. And then the building finished. So the ground vault here, the cross here, finished building. Then the mystical uh, vault in Auroville. This is our training center. You have here a template giving the shape of the vault. The back wall here, cable wall to give the shape on the outside. Built with horizontal courses still here, and then vertical courses for the rest of the wall like this. Because for stability reason, I cannot build further horizontally. I have to build maximum to this height, and then vertical courses after to be stable when we build. And this was built in 37 days. Then a ground vault, which is segmental. We have here vaults on the four sides. Then the ground here with the template. This is built in uh, five days with four masons. This takes a long time because of the cutting of the blocks in the point here. Then the dome of the Dunalinga temple, which is elliptical section with a 22.60 meter diameter. So we have here elliptical shape for the dome. This has a string line to give the shape of the dome. We use the method that this is just to control the first position of the first block. And then we check the diameter with the metal tape, which was anchored from this one here. We have a um, tripod here to measure the length. This was after four or five weeks. After six weeks, 
Then we load the back here with gun and stones for stability reasons and needed to have something heavier. So this, uh, this one was built with fabrics. Unfortunately, we could not do it with CICB. We had no time to produce the blocks. So now we plaster the side of the ranch. Work at night because we were in a hurry to build the dome. That's why we built it in nine weeks because the guru wanted to have something very fast. At the end of the top, we measured with the compass, which was with aluminum, links the last blocks and uh, dome near completion. Don't finish in nine weeks. And uh, in a few months, I will have to build a dome one half times bigger than that, 33 meter diameter, but with CSCB that time. This was my condition. I would do it if I have it with CSCB. This will be built in Gujarat in North of India. Inside the dome, after nine weeks of work. Now, the closer dome of the temple near Oroville, uh, Nataraja temple. Template here for the close to dome. We have keystones here to link the dome with the masonry of the pyramid. We'll see after you have seen it yesterday. I will show it after again. Bone pattern in the corner. We have a small arch at the entrance for the ventilation of the room. Then what the accomplishment now? And we fill the pyramid with uh, filling with earth concrete. So the whole filling was done with earth concrete. It means uh, broken bricks and uh, stones, earth, cement, and sand, and gravel. And then the building finished in six months. Inside the temple. And then I will finish with that. In fact, uh, yesterday you have seen the photo finish. I will explain how it was done. This was a vault of Sharanam built in, uh, in a vault of 50 meter span, built in uh, five weeks. So we have here the template, which is the support for the first course of the wall. So it means this is not just a, from, just not a, a template, but it's a framework. Initially, the first course of the whole press on the on the template. And then we put string lines like this and to build without any support. So here we put some stone chips outside for the stability when you build. We lay the blocks here. And then we check the width between the both sides of the wall because we set that on both sides. One side comes from here, and the side comes from the left. And then we will meet in the center. And we'll check here that we have the same spacing to be parallel. Photo from inside. So this you have already seen. You know, I'll let you see that because this is the last slide now. So again, you can see here, uh, the mason put some motor on the side of the previous course. Motor was on the block adjusted by sliding and that's finished. It takes maximum what? 10 seconds to lay the block maximum. So we started from one side here and from this side also, then we meet in the center to leave the gap here for the scalate and for, for, for the ventilation. And then when this was finished, we built from this side for the barrel part of the wall. So this side is 15 meter span, one five, like here. And the other side on the right is 6.61 meters. You can see here the workers, they move the string line one by one because uh, sometimes we pull the string lines all the way through for the anterior vault. But in that case, it was better to have it move one by one for particular reason because of the geometry of the arch with the blocks here. So the principle was that the, the vault was resting on a concrete slab. You can see here, we did not have, the, I did not want to have any truss rod inside the vault. 
So the concrete slab here is working like a diaphragm slab. That's why we have a lot of steel on the side to take that first, which is pushing on both sides of the wall. Hello, Omar. I almost I'm a little late. Uh, hi, Saturn. No, no, take your time. Take your yes. time. This is uh, before last. Good to slide. see these videos. Good to see these videos. No? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, this was the building finished with four those concrete walls below. 15 meters uh, span here. Built with this, this kind of wood built in five weeks with an average of eight masons inside the front hall. And I'm finished. So now if you have questions, welcome. Mr. Joaquin Luciano. Has a question. He says, "Yes, how do these structures behave under earthquakes? What type of loads of stress do you consider in the calculus for the structure?" Uh, yes, in fact, uh, I cannot calculate the stress by an earthquake on the walls. I, I don't have the skill. But uh, I have seen the case of the walls in Bam, especially because you have seen, in fact, in one of the photos there was a wall from Agebam in Iran. Which, which had an, an earthquake in 2003. In fact, I was sent to Agebam with a project with UNESCO to, to try to understand the phenomenal mechanisms of vault and domes with an earthquake. And of course, a lot of vaults had collapsed, but I was really surprised to see how many vaults could stand the earthquake. And this was really rich teaching for me to understand that uh, vault and domes are much more resilient resilient than we think. And uh, especially when you have seen, you remember, in fact, in one of the photos, maybe, I, uh, no, I will not go back and take too much time for Omar, but- uh, No, 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 feel free, feel free. Okay, okay, let me come back on the photo. I will share my screen again. Let me see what it was, this one, that I cannot waste too much time. This was, uh, uh, yes, this one. Okay, I will share my screen again. So this vault, this was in Agebam. There was just long cracks in the vault. And this happened because there was a symmetrical load on the, in fact, there was, a, in fact, there was more inertia here on this side than this side. It was the vault cracked here. And there was the same, there was, a, there was another case, what was it? No, not this one. No, it was in a, yeah, this one. This was also in Agebam. In that case, you see the wall push was on the right side collapsed. That means there was not enough pressure. There was not a control thrust from this side for this one. Then this, the wall tilted a little bit. The wall deformed, it went slightly down here. There was longitudinal crack here and here. The vault opened here, but the vault did not collapse. And there were some cases I really wondered how the vault could stand because they should have fallen. And remember what I said in the stability study, that when we study the vault on the dome, we don't take in account the mortar or the strength of the vault or the dome. And in that case, in Agebam, they were all built with adobe. That means the third granular bricks with more mortar. And even if, we, even if the motor was cracked by the earthquake, it was still holding the machinery together. That's why vault and doors are very resilient to earthquakes, maybe more than concrete frame, especially when the concrete frames are not uh, well built. But myself, I cannot calculate the strength of a vault for an earthquake. I don't have that skill. Okay. Any other question? So Julia Guzman asks, is it recommended to use CSEB blocks in more arid places rather than tropical? Thinking about Dominican Republic, which has hurricane seasons every year, 
uh, in fact, yes, if you have such a weather, I would use yes, CSCB because I would use, I, I will not use raw earth. I will not use uh, Adobe because if you have Adobe, this means unstabilized. If you have any leakage or any problem because of the hurricane, we have problems. But in Roville, we, are in, we don't call them hurricane, but um, uh, cyclones, which are the same, in fact, just a different name. And the heaviest cyclone we had here was in 2011 with winds up to 153 kilometers an hour and during six hours. For six hours, the wind was constantly blowing at that speed, more or less, with peaks at 153 kilometers an hour. And all our buildings with vault and domes and everything that we have done with CSCB, they were all standing. And that means that this can, in fact, we now we integrate the wind pressure in the calculation for the vault on domes. At the time, I was not doing it. But still, you have seen the vault, the semicircle vault of six meter span, the vault of Dipanam. In fact, the vault of Dipanam of 10.35 meter span, the entrance of the vault was oriented from the direction of the wind. That means you had a big vault like this, and the wind was coming inside like this. And the vault did not move at all. That means that's why vault and domes are so heavy that they can resist a lot of stress, including earthquakes and uh, cyclones and hurricanes. Oh, also, um, Julia wanted to add, great, thank you. I also wanted to ask if in the mix of the block, instead of using clay, can you use kaolin? Now, can you repeat? I had the problem with my mic. Can you repeat, yeah. please? Um, she wanted to know if in the mix for the block or of the block, Instead of using clay, can one use kaolin? Yeah, but in fact, kaolin is one clay. In fact, uh, the thing is, when you want to do a CSCB or any other as techniques, you just take the soil with whatever it is uh, from the local place, and it has uh, clay inside with different qualities. And kaolin is one type of clay. That means, uh, for me, there is no interest to add a special clay to the soil because the soil itself has already some clays, surely of different types because soils have always different types of clays. So this means they could have colinite with momorinite inside the same soil. And uh, adding some choline will not help so much because choline is not very cohesive. Choline does not bind so well. That means I will not advise to add choline, but uh, in general, there is no need to add a special clay to the soil because there is enough clay and often too much clay that, that we need for the CSCB. Yes, thank you for the answer. Uh, Mrs. Caterina Ventruño, have you done any pilot with recycled materials, for instance, using slit or sand retrieved from water treatment plants to make the blocks? Uh, no, in fact, I, I have not done such research, but I have done recycling of blocks. In fact, I have crushed some blocks because we try to to use already broken blocks, for example, crush them and then reuse them for another compression with another block. And uh, you have to use again something that you cannot have just pure broken blocks which are crushed. You have to add again some soil because the thing is, when you stabilize the earth, when you add some cement, then the cement will stabilize the clay. That means the broken block cannot be really, in fact, the soil is not active anymore. The clay is not really dead, but it cannot bind anymore. That's why what we had to do was to mix some crushed blocks with, again, some fresh soil with some cement. And this could work. We have done some tests on that long ago, yes. But uh, it's not really interesting for us because you have to spend some time to, for crushing the soil it's better to use a uh, natural soil, but it's possible to do that. Perfect. Uh, she says, thank you. All right. Um, maybe we can proceed with Mrs. O Mr. Omar, the presentation. And if anybody has any questions for Mr. Salprem, he can answer it also at the end of this, uh, Mr. Omar's session. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I uh, believe, uh, based on my understanding of, of the aim of this lecture, uh, is that uh, we will try to give a basic understanding of the concept of bioclimatic architecture and try to link 
what we try to give an idea of the main bioclimatic earth workshop that uh, I have been teaching at the Oroville Earth Institute in uh, collaboration with both uh, Lara Davis and Saprim uh, for uh, the past uh, some years now. We have been doing it for many years now. So to give an idea of what we try to do at the Earth Institute, uh, linking two fields, which are rarely linked in this in the way we do, and uh, and uh, and while giving principles to uh, uh, giving idea on the basic principles of bioclimatic architecture. So so what is bioclimatic architecture? Uh, uh, I think the first thing when we touch upon the issue of bioclimatic architecture is we go to the origin, we go to our understanding to, to nature and observe how nature functions. And, uh, and from there, we try to grasp the essence of what is bioclimatic architecture. But maybe before I, I, I go there in a bit detail, I, I would like to share the, the story of the workshop uh, and how it started. Uh, a few years back, I was working with Saprim on some researches, researches at the Orville Earth Institute. I came first time to the Orville Earth Institute 2007 when I was doing my uh, research uh, of Master of Science in Architecture Studies at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and, and they didn't have much experience with natural materials. You know, they mostly work with, uh, with uh, uh, high tech. And, and they, they were interested in Earth. And uh, this is why I managed to get a grant and go to the Oracle Earth Institute as it's known to be one of the most uh, developed centers of Earth architecture. And, uh, and I learned the basics and principles of uh, um, uh, CCB and uh, the production and even spent, managed to spend some time on a construction site to get, not to become a mason, but to get the sense of a mason, to, um, to become an architect with the sense of a mason. And, uh, and while doing my experiment, and then spend time doing my experiments on uh, uh, compressed earth blocks to get a sense of how to expand its capacities, leading to a thesis with the name, revealing the potential of compressed earth blocks, a visual narration. Then I leave, then one after five six years of experiences, I decided to come back to the Earth Institute to do research and to participate in teaching. Uh, while being there, it just came this idea that we keep using Earth in many places, but sometimes without I see the use of Earth not necessarily bioclimatized. I mean by that you find, for example, the model of dome and vault that exist in the Middle East. And Hassan Fatsi, uh, and uh, who somehow I come from the Hassan Fatsi tradition because I did, did study in the Faculty of Fine Arts in, in Egypt before I traveled to the United States and different countries. And Hassan Fatsi was a teacher, but before I, I, I joined, of course. So, but his legacy remains in the school. But the concept of a dome and a vault and this kind of a traditional form works in specific climates more than others and and was always the question to me how to bioclimatize earth but in reality if you look at the vernacular you will find earth is very bioclimatized earth takes all kinds of different shapes based on the climate you will find earth architecture in japan very different than indonesia very different than in colder climates very different than in the middle east very different then in hot and dry, how hot and humid is different than hot and dry. You always find earth and architecture has this capacity, malleable capacity to take very different forms. Sometimes this light, low thermal mass earth architecture, like Watelandob, and then some other times this is heavy, very heavy, uh, 80 centimeters and one meter and one and a half meter, and very heavy. And, and that depends on the climate in many cases. So, so my search was, uh, and this came the idea of the of the design studio, bioclimatic earth. So the students would come and learn the basics of earth, but also bioclimatic design simultaneously, 
and spend time in a studio environment, a design studio environment in which they design, they work on a design project in which uh, in different countries, each group get a site in a, in a very different country. I remember we had Bangkok, we had Montreal, we had Kyoto, we had Mini in Egypt, uh, um, we had uh, London, and we were investigating what if we are building with Earth in this climate, how we use Earth. So, and the students, based on their understanding of Earth quality and understanding of bioclimatic design principles, they find the Earth in solution that works for this climate. And it was very um, uh, amusing that at the end, the students co can compare their work to see to which degree Earth is changing from the hot and humid to the hot and dry, for example. So, so one of the first things that we do is to when we try to understand bioclimatics, and then we link it to Earth, but when we start to understand bioclimatics, we observe nature first. And, and the first question that comes to me when I look at a picture like this, what, what are these elements? This is a picture taken from the book, uh, the very seminal publication designed with the climate, bioclimatic approach to architectural regionalism by Victor Ogai, one of the founders of the field of bioclimatic architecture. Uh, uh, and uh, one of those who I really study carefully because he was both an academic uh, teaching at Princeton but also a practitioner, a modernist practitioner, and he really managed to link between architect modern architecture and bioclimatic design through very beautiful examples. But when I look at a picture like this, uh, uh, comes the question, what are these elements? You see the scale bigger than a human being, if they look natural, you do not know if they are part of a tree, they are, what are they? But they are all having very linear proportion and they all have, uh, they are basically all uh, have one orientation. So you have, if it's, a, if it's a stone, why we have one orientation? If it's a tree, why we have one orientation? Interestingly, these are uh, termite mounds and, uh, and, uh, and they are called compass termites. It's a type of termite that basically makes these very stretched mounds that has a, a very strictly eastern and western facade. And with the tip of, the, of this mound, it points to the magnetic north. That's why they are called compass termites. They really find the magnetic north and they point to it and, and it's very it's a wonder why they why in nature you find orientation so clear in, in a case like this and and the answer is the need of the life of the termites they they hatch they have an inner circulation at the center of the mound and then they have chambers on the right and the left which means east and west and they hatch the eggs and they, the termites basically with this orientation assure a similar amount of heating, similar amount of heating to, to uh, sort of the hatching for the, on the two sides, which maximize the use. Basically, basically it's a concept to have a double corridor, a double room corridor instead of a single room corridor, right? Uh, uh, and to assure that all of the chambers have equal heating. Uh, uh, and imagine if it was oriented like we orient in our own bioclimatic architecture, let's say many architects we like to orient north and south because north uh, is much more easy to control solar radiation uh, when you have a, a, a more north and south orientation than east and west. But in this case, uh, uh, the thermite has very different approach because they want to equalize Heat uh, reception in the state of controlled uh, solar radiation, uh, meaning con uh, uh, I, I mean by control to be able, for example, to get the sun in the winter more and less in the summer, or no, not sun, not no direct solar radiation in the summer more in the winter, and you can achieve this mostly when you have a a, 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 nor a thousand facade mostly. This is what we, what helps you to achieve this. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so this is an example in, in which shows that in nature you have examples of uh, 
uh, orientation based on solar uh, radiation conditions. Uh, another example that I love very much uh, is the banyan tree. And, uh, and I, 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 considering that I live now in Oroville in India and I experience plenty of banyan trees, I always ask myself the question, why the banyan tree takes this horizontal geometry? Like banyan trees have done an enormous effort to, to, to change the, the typical proportion, to, to have an, a more horizontal proportion while many other trees have this vertical proportion, right? So the question of proportion, why a tree would take a horizontal proportion and another tree would take a vertical proportion. Interestingly, in my research and even discussions with ecologists, because the banyan tree found that this is the best, this is actually the ideal uh, uh, solution in general, because what the tree wants to do is to get more sun and more organic matter, right? more sources of water, more resources of organic matter, and more sun. So when you go horizontally, you have more possibility to gain sun, right? And when you expand horizontally, you also, you know the banyan tree technique that the stem transform into a root, right? It's a, it's a brilliant structural <laughs> technique to expand horizontally. A beam becomes a column, right? Uh, <laughs> Maybe one day in architecture, we see something like this. The beam somehow generate a column that gradually goes to the ground, creating a foundation. And the foundation has the capacity to link to organic matter and water. So in that scenario, you find the banyan tree is expanded horizontally, and it, that's why she can gain more organic matter, more water, and more exposure to solar radiation. So now the other question is, now uh, when I recognize that this is the ideal solution, I start asking the other question, then why all other trees, or why most other trees doesn't go horizontally in the same way that the banyan uh, does? If that's the optimal solution for a, a creature that it is seeking more organic matter and more solar radiation. The reason is competition. The banyan tree is not the ideal solution, and this is a very good lesson to learn in architecture. The ideal solution in many of the textbook bioclimatic design solution can only exist in under ideal conditions, right? So, so the ideal condition in this case to have a space to expand horizontally. And that happens while the, the climate is not too harsh. For example, uh, let's imagine that you are in really tropical, tropical, tropical. It's very difficult to expand horizontally like this because in a tropical, tropical, you will find lots of competition lots of life, lots of diversity of, of plants, uh, flora and fauna, lots of competition. And this is when many of the trees goes up to compete over to get a piece of the sun, let's say. Competition to go horizontally to get a piece of the sun. The trees and the plants that cannot devise other techniques to need less sun until you will find in very heavy Amazon situations, uh, type of uh, flora and fauna, uh, uh, type of plants that doesn't need needs very dark conditions and they can live in, in under all of these layered uh, forests. But the but you find here the the basically the the so you cannot do it in 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 in, in very in the very rich uh, tropical uh, uh, conditions because of all of the diversity and all the uh, uh, competition. Uh, but uh, but if you go to the desert, you cannot also do it because the more you expand and you have a big surface, the more you lose uh, humidity, you lose heat, you, uh, you gain too much heat, you lose too much water content uh, from the surfaces of the, of the leaf, right? So you cannot really, you find plants in a desert condition try to minimize its surface, right? Not to lose too much. Uh, 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 water from its body. Uh, if you go to the cold, you will find also plants find techniques to minimize surfaces. In this case, not to lose heat, right? So, but but the banyan somehow, not in a cold, not in the cold, not in the harsh cold, not in the desert, not in the tropical. It's in the transition between. It's mostly in savanna uh, climates. When there is a transition 
in which there is a tropical, subtropical, and then it is moving a little bit in not the very dense tropical, but maybe the subtropicals and moving towards the savanna uh, and, and towards gradually towards the desert, desert climate. So, so this is when there is space. There is space, but still there is organic matter in most, in most of the land, right? And there is, so this, this is when a, a tree can expand horizontally, interestingly, only to achieve the optimal solution for the tree, right? So it's a very good reminder when you speculate this kind of a, this type of a tree to understand that the very typical bioclimatic solution that we always study in books can only, only belong to very, very ideal situations. But most of the time when we work in a dense city, it, it is never there. And we work in a, a complex climate that has elements of the hot and dry, hot and humid uh, uh, composites. Uh, it, it's never the ideal solution. And this is when you have to be very innovative in finding a uh, bioclimatic solution that fits uh, these typical, uh, these unusual, these usually unusual situations. Uh, an example of the type of trees that compete over a piece of the sun, uh, when there is, uh, the climate allows and there is more competition to get a piece of the sun. Uh, uh, um, the, other, the other example is a model uh, to understand topography and how topography has very major impact on the flora and the fauna. And I, I do remember uh, 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 in, a, in a trip in which we went to observe uh, uh, plant, uh, plants and, and immigrant birds uh, around Oroville, I discovered that the whole flora and fauna is so defined by one element, the topography. There are areas in which there is shallow water and there are areas in which there are deeper water and there are areas in which there is much less water and then there are areas in which it's a, it's a bit dry and and you always find the areas of the deep areas doesn't have plants in the water and then the little bit mid, midway shallow has plants that grows and then another type of plants and then the more you go up with the topography you have another type of plant and then based on the topography leads to the situation of the water, based on the situation of the water in, in a swamp basically leads to the type of plants. And then based on the type of plants, you have the type of birds. So you will find the birds, some birds hatch very close to the water, some birds hatch closer to the trees, some birds hatch above the trees on, on a stem to protect. It depends on the nature of the plant of the of the plants and the nature of the of the of the birds they change their positioning uh, uh, to hatch, uh, to have their egg, eggs hatching. So we remember, and sometimes we do re don't remember in architecture, that, that the element of topography is of significant importance of nature that really defines the full uh, composition of flora and fauna. And we rarely, uh, 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 when we design architecture, let's say, uh, uh, zone based on topography we we always let's say the modernist uh, we we zone mostly based on uh, function but sometimes we forget that we can also adjust the topography in many cases there have been of course some history many architects who who has been shown amazing capacity to work with topography uh, 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 another example is the eucalyptus tree and uh, when we observe the eucalyptus tree, we find that most of the year, big part of the year, it has these two co colors, the dark brown and the, and the off-white shiny. But during one season, it is fully shiny, fully light. And in another season, uh, uh, it's fully dark. And, and, uh, and when we research, you might discover that it's actually very sensible mechanism to reduce loss of energy. So you will find in the colder time, it is fully dark uh, uh, to absorb as much uh, heat as possible. And in the hot time, it is fully shiny and light to reflect. So it's almost like clothing technique. It's as we change our clothes and adapt. So, so this opened the topic of adaptive opportunities in, in architectural design and, and, and of course, we, we are used to make all of these shots 
of, of how the building looks like. But I have also learned through studying that Lemus architecture that it is one shot doesn't make any sense because one shot gives the indication that this building is fixed. It looks like this all year. It looks like this in every single season and it looks like this day and night. But maybe you need 20 shots, not one, to show how this building has the capacity to change uh, its facade, its veneer, how it adapts, uh, uh, how people can you adapt in it uh, based in different, in different seasons, in different conditions, in different times. So we learn from nature. Uh, 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 we learn from nature the basics. We learn how we adapt, how building is, should be designed to adapt, uh, how the topography is a significant, significant importance, uh, how the proportion exists in nature and, and uh, some same type of a plant, uh, a part, different types of plants takes different proportions uh, uh, to, achieve, to, to fit into different climatic conditions and orientation of the highest importance. So here comes the very basic conclusion is that bioclimatic architecture is not, is not, and I really would like to emphasize this, it's not what we see in, in advertising, magazine, marketing, of a skyscraper full of trees above it and everywhere in it, uh, or, or devices like uh, buildings that have plenty of solar, uh, solar uh, photovoltaics and, and wind, uh, wind uh, devices and all this. However, these are complementary elements can be added when needed. Simply, biclimatic architecture is good architecture. Biclimatic architecture is when architecture is fit in its context exactly like uh, nature fits in its context. No, no, not exactly because we can never compete, but at least get an inspiration for nature to fit uh, 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 with the proportion, with the simple elements, like what is the proportion of the building? What is the orientation of the building? What is the window to floor ratio? Uh, uh, what are the... Uh, uh, um, the, how to deal with the topography, how to, how to react to the topography, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, very, all of these very simple parameters for the building in the concept design level is what really define uh, bioclimatic architecture. Uh, so how to, how to be adaptive, how the architecture can adapt to different changes in, in, in one climate. So these, so if you still, uh, from these, and, and there is nothing more bioclimatic than vernacular architecture, basically, because uh, it is really good architecture. It is the architecture that is the result of an evolutionary process that uh, people living in one place through experimentation has been conducting for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. And, Plenty of errors and, and correcting mistakes and all happening collectively. So you have all the minds of the people living in one place and they test something and they change and they, whatever works, they produce again and again and then they evolve and then they test again. And, and this happens over thousands of years or at least hundreds of years and leads to this magnificent architecture. So it's a very major source of inspiration as much as nature. And I would I would even link it to nature. I, somehow I feel organic architecture is as natural in a way, in many cases, as uh, a bird producing, making their own nest or, or uh, a termite making their own colony. I feel in many cases the natural architecture is natural in a similar way. Uh, it's produced by human beings, but through a natural process, let's say. Uh, uh, so two examples, one to the left, one to the right, and one shows to the left is the hot and dry, uh, an example of uh, uh, a built environment in hot and dry climate, and, uh, and to the right uh, uh, in hot and humid. And, and you see innocently the difference of the density, the question of density, uh, uh, the difference of the type of street, the difference of the geometries of the building, the difference of the polar to void ratio, uh, the difference of the nature of the corrugated passage to the left and plaza carved in a specific way, 
and uh, the porosity, the geometry of the building helps the flow of the air because these people in, in, this, in this built environment use the transitional spaces between the buildings more than the buildings themselves. This is a village in, in South Sudan, uh, and, and these kind of societies use these spaces in between the huts more than the huts itself. This is why the geometry of the hut somehow helps with this porosity to maintain very good flow of air, which is very needed in this climate, uh, uh, shade, a mix of shade and air. Uh, uh, to the left, you don't want too much air flow. You want very little and very controlled uh, flow. That's why uh, you want to control from the dust. That's why all of these corrugated passes. You need the uh, cool reserves of cool air that you get very early in the morning. Uh, all of these very small, very controlled in proportion, courtyards controlled in sectional proportion. And even you see how shaped is the, the plaza. It's almost designed to gain max, to maximize uh, 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 shadow from the east and the west between. All right. So, so, so we learn also, we observe nature, we observe the principles of biometrics. Uh, uh, but that the, the, all of this develops a higher level of intuition, right? Informed intuition. But when we study biomedics today, in, informed intuition is of high importance. But there is something else. And here I I get back to my uh, 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 a slide that my advisor at the Architecture Association in London uh, during the uh, Master of Science FED program. Uh, Timo Kianat, and he is one of the founders also of the, of the field, always show this uh, an, a, a slide, and it really did, uh, let's say, uh, strike a chord in, in, uh, when any time he shows this, I am most alert, and I am thinking about the meaning of, of this slide, because he always say, if there is a specific form and specific feature, a specific character of Bioclimatic architecture or sustainable architecture. Uh, and he shows this building and, and he says this was possibly the most energy efficient building in, in the UK for long, for some time. Uh, and it was uh, only the, the energy needed is five kilowatt hours per square meter. And, and it doesn't look like the images that we see in, by the uh, fancy architects doing the. Uh, this is green, this is green, this is green, and, and it doesn't have any specific feature. You, you could mistake it while you are moving in the street. It's just that they really calculated how much, uh, how to deal with this orientation, how to have the surface to volume ratio, the window to floor ratio, the size of the windows, the, uh, how to deal with the solar radiation, how much solar radiation you are, you are uh, 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 accepting the the uh, infiltration rate, air infiltration rate, all of the calculations, and, and then it leads to this very rigorous uh, solution. But it's not saying I am biclimatic, I am green, uh, uh, but we, the architects, somehow love to transform a technique into a character, right? This is the whole modernist movement, what they did. If we look at Mies, Corpusier, this is what they did. They, they looked at the the, the, the new technology of reinforced concrete, of steel, uh, of uh, they have now we have now uh, 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 different dimensions of glasses. We have different techniques. They give it a character, right? They they try to create a new architectural language through understanding the technology. Right? That is the very big part of their contribution. They even created new aesthetics, the aesthetics of the industrial, the aesthetics of these new technologies. And we architects love to create also the aesthetics of our understanding of the bioclimatic. But when, when maybe rigorous engineers and technician, technicians work uh, on it based on solid calculations, they might get something else. So, so what, what, what is it? Should we use our intuition and create a character, or, or sh we should go to the rigorous analytical? And, and, uh, and I am. I am somehow believing I'm somebody who believes both. Both. I think uh, Simos and I did disagree with him when I was a student uh, under him because I was more oriented towards let's have more intuition 
I, but I don't know. It always happens when you leave your teachers, you start thinking about the whole thing, and you you start reconsidering and learning more. And, and I think he was always saying something that architecture was always tied to mathematics. When you look at how the master builders used to work, you will find mathematics is very involved. It's very integral in the process. And, and I started to believe that a very good approach would be to mix intuition, uh, environmental intuition to mathematics and analytical. And this is what I try to do whenever I have the time. Uh, so one example in which I find it intriguing to see how some mathematics and some analytical work could lead, could uh, interact with some uh, 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 intuitive uh, understanding. First of all, let me check the time because I could, I could go for whatever. Uh, now it is six to eight. 30. We started eight, right? So, hello? Hello? Angela? Hear you clearly. So, just checking. Uh, so, we started around eight, right? So, I I have how much more uh, until nine, let's say? For me, there is no problem. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, all right. All right. So, I, I just continue. So, uh, so uh, this is uh, an example in which, in which it shows this possible relation between what we call analytical and, and, and intuitive. Uh, my research for the climate in Oregon, and this is uh, uh, considering that I am working here, I'm working on different examples of architecture here, and I am observing the vernacular, the nature here. And when I, I create the biclimatic, uh, the, the, this is psychometric chart, I find this situation in which in Tamil Nadu, it's, it's, uh, it's a nightmare, basically, because it's, you know, in, according to this uh, psychometric chart, if you understand the basic concept, if you are in this region, up and, and in hot, somewhere here, let's say, it's hot and humid, right? If you are spread down here, if the points are spread down here, it's hot and dry, if it is really here, it's cold, right? Here will be, a if it is mostly here, it's temperate, right? But here you have a very big area in which it is really humid, it's really humid. This is very easy to control, this part, very easy to control. But this part here, it's really humid, but then the most difficult part, when it really exceeds 35, it's still very humid, but it goes up to 40, and this is the design, I think, sometimes in extreme cases, it gets to 42. So it's extreme hot and humid. It's not the typical warm and humid. It's, it's one of these, the, the climate of Tamil Nadu. And to really understand this situation, uh, uh, you compare it to this diagram. Of, I remember this was Bangkok, I think. And, and this is the very typical situation in the very typical hot and humid in which most of this concentration of the points are mostly before 35. It, it goes to 32, 33. So now, now very interesting because uh, uh, what confused me and, and, and I struggled with is that we categorize the climate in Oroville as dominantly hot and humid, right? But, and the typical hot and humid solution, uh, uh, which I, I mean by this, the textbook solution, is like uh, uh, very dispersed architecture. You separate between the function, the, you, you have very light thermal mass, you have as much open as possible and lots of flow of airflow, uh, lots of airflow. But then I find the, by the, the uh, which is this solution? See how how this part of the building, southeast. In, uh, uh, I think this from Malaysia. Uh, uh, this part of the building, uh, or Thailand, as I remember, this part of the building separated from this part of the building, separated from this part of the building with links, and everything is open, everything is light, everything is uh, uh, raised uh, and penalty penalty. Uh, but the architecture, the dominant architecture in Tamil Nadu is heavy, 
and has courtyards. And, and, uh, and uh, there is the Pakka and the Kacha. The Pakka is when you have money and you build these type of very heavy structures. The Kacha, when you do not have money and you build very light structures, but if once you get money, you build the Pakka, basically. Uh, uh, so interestingly, so I was confused for a while because how come the this we are in a hot and humid climate and and we do not have the very typical solution of the hot and humid as we always study in in, in textbook uh, disperse and light and low thermal mass and the the solution of course comes from the difference is that 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 is the extreme hot and humid and and you when you see again the this so the the blue circle uh, ellipse define the zone of Bangkok while the re but 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 the rest shows how a climate of hot and humid could be very different including these extreme situations here especially here when the humidity really goes up but here when the humidity goes up and the temperature is above 35 34 and it goes to 39 for lo quite some time for, for a month or two uh, uh, now, how to deal with this month or two in which the temperature is 39 and the humidity is quite high. Here, so, so, so interestingly, when you really think about it, you will find, yes, it's the hot and humid climate is humid most of the time because if you are not here. You are mostly here. You are up. And these are the high humidity uh, areas. But at the same time, it has some of the characteristics of the hot and dry because the temperature goes into this zone between the textbook hot and humid and the textbook hot and dry. The textbook hot and dry temperature goes to 45, 46, right? And the textbook hot and humid temperature goes to 32. But the hot and the extreme hot and humid conditions in Tamil Nadu where we are, the temperature goes to 39, 40, 42. So it's somewhere in between the two. Temperatures, and this is why there is no wonder that you will find a situation in which it gets some of the climatic solutions that are in hot and dry, sometimes needing to have heavy uh, structures, sometimes at least for the daytime. So, what I found that in our climate, daytime the buildings with heavy thermal mass would, uh, would uh, perform better uh, 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 when they are used in the day. and. Uh, this is why workplaces could work very good if they are uh, uh, a little bit heavier. Uh, on the uh, not not when I say heavy heavy thermal mass, I do not mean equal to the hot and dry with the extremely heavy walls and very small openings. I mean somewhere in between. But the light light, which is the very light thermal mass with steel columns or with bamboo or with wooden uh, structures, uh, works better in the night night time. Uh, especially if up has very good airflow and uh, and uh, and uh, for sleeping, so you find the situation in which it's interesting that you can find you have to learn when to be heavy. And you find I find myself in Tamil Nadu. You need a solution that it is between this and this. Sometimes it is light and sometimes it is heavy. The use of the courtyard is very possible, but special type of a courtyard, not the typical, not the courtyard of the hot and dry. Uh, uh, and uh, some part of the buildings needs to be heavy. Some parts of the buildings could be light and, and offer the adaptive opportunity for the users to use based on, 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 uh, on, on the need. And you see people doing this naturally. Uh, like anything we invent, when you, when you search carefully, you find people are doing it naturally in many cases. So I have some friends who have uh, a usual house with uh, windows and uh, let's say CCD walls on the ground, uh, but then uh, they create, after time they find it very difficult to sleep. So they go on the roof and they create a mosquito mesh and they start sleeping and then they start raining. So it's not enough. They create a sheet roof or a light uh, corrugated metal sheet roof above. And, and this becomes a place to sleep, except in the two months in which it is a little, uh, slightly uh, moderate, uh, more moderate, uh, but most of the year you sleep up and, and, uh, and, uh, and you live down. Uh, uh, 
So, so you find people are doing it, this mix of, of heavy and light, and it's an opportunity for innovation. So this is what we learn, is that you take, you take the concept of bioclimatic, then you go and say, what type of earth construction we can use for this climate, what kind of use for this climate, and in complex climates, what, what kind of a mix, which, 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 which kind of a proportion. And you use this as a starting point of innovation, and I think it's much better and much more versatile than I am a architect and I have one signature and I am repeating it everywhere, right? So, so if you use the, the climate as, as, as a trigger point uh, uh, to innovate, you will find that your innovations are drastically, uh, dramatically changing from one climate to another. Uh, here, interestingly, when you carefully look at this, you'll find that how brilliant and how beautiful is uh, solutions in, uh, in vernacular systems uh, because look at the uh, look at the courtyard. This courtyard and this geometry can never exist in a hot and dry because it, it is the courtyard of the hot and dry. So courtyard is a universal solution that it is needed for many cultural and social reasons, but you find it how, how it can change dramatically uh, from, let's say, the hot and humid, the hot and dry, the typical courtyard is, of course, of the hot and dry, but how you have amazing typologies of courtyards in hot and humid. You will find usually bigger courtyards in many cases, but if it is small because there is no space, you will find also other, other solutions to, to bring the air. Because the hot and humid, you want air. Uh, uh, air is the main factor. Because otherwise, how to how to counter the 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 feeling of the feeling of humidity, right? Either. So, so look how the 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 shaped route to the inside both has the capacity to bring the rain inside because some of them plant love to plant these projects. You bring the rain inside, but also it brings air inside for most. Of or you bring rain inside mainly in the monsoon time, but but for the rest of the the, the, the year you bring air inside through Kowanda effect, right? Kowanda effect is one of the feature one factor that leads air to move move with the with the with the surfaces to the inside uh, to the down inside part of the of the of the courtyard. Uh, another technique, and this is, a, uh, I call it a technique in the section, they say, uh, another technique I find very interesting in the plan, the al how they align all of the doors on one line, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and that is again for very powerful uh, airflow. I see it amazing in some cases. Once, of course, there is different pressure on one side and the other. So if this is a plus pressure, there's a minus pressure, this is an amazing graph. If there is a movement of the air in this direction, let's say it can create a suction from here. So, so, so it's a courtyard that encourages airflow, both in plan and section. And how, how, how this is very interesting to me. I'm somebody who, uh, I'm, I'm Egyptian and, and, and I, I have spent lots of time in Cairo. So I'm very aware of the, the courtyard solution in traditional Cairo, the traditional hot and, and dry, you never see an aligned, aligned uh, doors like this. You never see aligned doors because you do not want to encourage too much air. You do not, the air is so hot in, in, in the hot and dry, it's 45 degrees, why would you encourage airflow? The, the, the 45, 50 even, why you encourage the flow? The, the, the air is dusty. So in the hot and dry, you want very slow air movement. Very slow air movement and very controlled. You need to cool it. You need to take the air, take the dust out of it, cool it, <laughs> then use it or, or get the air from up uh, through wind catchers, humidify uh, and use or, or uh, get the air uh, during five at five a.m. in the morning, to a very well proportioned courtyard, and then heat it there as a storage, and use it carefully. But you do not have this situation, right? So this is a technique of adapting a concept 
the concept of repeated courtyards uh, with in plan to assure a movement of airflow uh, uh, while at the same time uh, uh, in section you you uh, you uh, emphasize uh, you can also create roofing aerodynamic roofs to to create a movement of air in the in the courtyard so of course i'm, I'm here focusing on the bioclimatic origin of form and, and, and solution, but of course, it is much, much more complex. If you if we research an example, you will find several parameters and several uh, roots to every solution, cultural, social, sometimes religious, but in this, in this lecture, of course, we focus on the, on the back end. And then they merge, they always merge. You find somehow the, the temple, organization could relate to the bioclimatic solution and then you do not know which one first but but they end up meeting each other uh, so so basically the workshop uh, or the teaching method the studio design studio uh, uh, both my own personal design studio in Oroville and as well as my teaching try to create this uh, uh, Try to find the space between analytical and intuitive. Basically. Of course, here the diagram is that this is one and this is one, and I don't know. I have always been struggling with the two. I shift from one to another, but but while shifting from one to another, we always try to to find to have more capacity to blur that line, basically, so that we start from here, but we try with time to blur the line. Uh, the more you do analytical, the more you gain intuition. Uh, the more you uh, are intuitive, you need to do more strategic analytical. So you you will find then you the and at the end, what is architecture to me? What is good architecture is to me when poetry meets numbers. When the poetry meets the numbers, and and that's why you need both. So uh, to give a very a very basic understanding of the biomimetic approach, as let's say I am coming into the origin or to the roots uh, with the with the main semi seminal publications of Victor Algaia. The main concept is basically to work with nature, with the forces of nature, not against those forces of nature. So you work with the sun, the sun movement, the solar radiation, the wind movement, the uh, 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 humidity, the water elements, the topography. You work with forces of nature. When you work with the forces of nature, you can use their potential to create better living in conditions. Basically, you have to go to the human and understand the human compass and, and utilize these natural elements for this comfort. And the issue of comfort is very wide and very complex. And it changes uh, because the nature of people changes based on the living space. And when you achieve this, when you are working on this, you end up in a state of climatic balance. It's architecture that achieves climatic balance. For so Winter Ardai, I said architecture cannot exist on its own. You need to be a polymath, a bi an architect who works in the modern time on biclimatic concepts, has to be a polymath in a way. He has to understand some sense of climatology, he understands some things to understand, to analyze the climate, to understand biology. To understand human comfort, understand the technology, and I think here by he doesn't only need technology as devices, he means solutions and uh, either manual or mechanical or architecture solutions. And all of this would lead to uh, architecture. All of this at the end for what bioclimatic architecture is. And he created this sequence, he has seen it in a more according to his description more in a sequence to study in a very systematic way that climatic conditions uh, and then understand the human comfort needs, how to utilize the climate, and then look at the technologies, let's like, see the material, the a technique like wind catchers, what kind of steel you have, what kind of uh, glass you have, and all of this together could lead to our special solution. For me, I don't believe in, in, in an architectural design process that has any specific uh, sequence. I, I believe in any case you can start from a different point and you go to another, as long as at the end 
you manage to get to create a state of integration, harmony and integration. And I think you can absolutely use your intuition to start from a hypothesis, architectural hypothesis, then start researching the technology and modifying the biology, the human comfort and modify the plant and modify. And, and for me, it, it, it really changed this from one project to another and also changed based on your level of informed intuition. Uh, and, and here I really emphasize the word informed before intuition, because with time you keep, you have more intuition. Why? Because you have done more analytical work, you have studied more cases, and now you are gaining more intuition. So it's, it's not the intuition of the not knowledgeable, it's the intuition based on experiences and, and knowledge. So the design process includes, when I give just examples, uh, very quick examples to give an idea of uh, about the design process. Uh, I'm very close, but I think it's, it's, I might spend a bit more time than you. So the design, the design process includes uh, uh, the typical design process studies of sun, shade and shadow. This was an example of some of the work I have done with the team during the master degree, uh, master of science degree at the at the architecture uh, association in which we study how to gain uh, some uh, uh, more uh, uh, in, in transitional spaces like a courtyard in London, how to shape the building to get more sun in different, in, in, in an acceptable amount of the year. So, you know, sun is very scarce in, in the UK and in London and, and, you, and when you work in a temperate school climate like London and manage to get uh, uh, sun in specific times of the day, it can become a very successful uh, usable space because the, the, the ground level could include some cafes, some restaurants, and then people can bring their food and sit and enjoy the bit of green and bit of sun. If you are also protected from the wind, that, then this creates a very beautiful transition space that is usable. So you shape your architecture to achieve the sun conditions in a transitional space, right? And this is one of the very major concepts when, when you really work pro, com, enough on a transitional space, it really impacts architecture around it. So I think one of the keys when you work on in a sustainable design on a backlog design is that you really focus, decide what type of a transitional space you want, a courtyard, an atrium, a corridor. And to which degree it is shaded, to which degree, what is its proportion, what is its orientation, how the sun interacts with this transitional space, etc. A very simple sun studies that shows actually as simple as, as, as they are, they can actually achieve, you can achieve a lot with these simple studies in section. Uh, uh, and, and in this study, this is a study I did myself on, on this project by Norman and Foster, just to this, just shows. Uh, to which degree the project is authentically achieving what it claims to, to what it claims and or to which degree it doesn't achieve uh, some studies like this could be a very high help if you are really shaping the building properly based on the sun angle uh, and especially I, I think when you study also the elevation uh, sun angle in the, in the in the section simultaneously with the azimuth sun angle and the, and the, in the plan, you can achieve a lot of forming. It's a form, very simple form finding technique. Uh, and of course, you can use uh, the sun angle 12, uh, 12 uh, noon, let's say for the south facade, but when you go to the east and west, you use 3 p.m. and maybe uh, 10 or 9 a.m. to change the, the time and the, in which you get the angle for. Maybe this is uh, for a more practical session than, than this uh, introductory lecture. So uh, uh, another type of study of highest importance is thermal simulation. Of course, there are different types of thermal uh, simulation tools. Some of them doesn't work. Some of them are static uh, thermal simulation tools, which are has proven not to be very successful. But some of the more complex dynamic thermal simulations are could be of a good value. I mean, they will never be as accurate as the natural conditions, but because, uh, you know, a simulation is as good as the data you, you put as input, uh, but at the same time, and at the same time, the input in nature is too complex to, to replicate, to, to emulate, but, but, but you can get 
some of these is to put enough data pretty accurate to a high degree, some, a good level of accuracy, uh, especially let's say for an artifact, let's say on a concept design level. And it's very simple game uh, if you just understand this. To, to, let's don't focus on everything. This just the black line and the red line. In this case, the black line represents that let's say the temperature fluctuations outside the building in, in this climate. Right? The mean outdoor temperature, which is the basic temperatures outside, while this red represents inside your building, yeah, or inside the room in your building. And this gray line is the comfort zone. It's a very typical game that we have learned to do. You make a design and uh, it's a design hypothesis based on analytical process first. You make an analytical a design hypothesis and then you verify. So when you verify, basically, you, you create, you build it in a simulation tool and then you check in a specific room and see. Let's imagine the temperature. You This is a sign of success, right? Because here the climate is very cold, it's very uncomfortable. But at the same time, this house managed to get, it, get the temperature in the comfort zone. So this is when you achieve success. Imagine if it is going like this up and down, or if it's going a little down and sometimes up. You you work again and again, hoping that you manage to get max as much as you can within the comfort zone. So so it's again another tool to shape your building to to change the pro, the orientation, the proportion, the wind to flow ratio, the material, the insulation, the all of this until you manage to get the right composition. Of materiality, porosity, uh, 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 geometry, proportion, all this that leads to comfort in this climate. Uh, this is just one example of uh, a, a sunny day in winter. It was designed for a sunny day in winter uh, in London. In London, uh, which if you manage to get it properly in London in winter, that means that it is easy most of the year. It's much easier to deal with most of the year. Another type of simulation is a very simple aerodynamic simulation in which I myself have been experimenting with type of jelly and type of uh, kobogo uh, and how they can uh, infiltrate airflow and enhance the speed of airflow. Uh, 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 which angle of this uh, geometrical uh, geometrical shape you can can feed airflow and can lead to more homogeneous airflow on the other side of the of the screen. This was a study I I did with the, a team and, and, and friends of mine who have given some skills during this working on this project. Uh, and using physical models is the same. Uh, so some of the work needs to be done digitally through simulation, some simple uh, manual tools, some more complex digital simulations, and then some uh, uh, mock-up uh, that shows when you develop something, how the light would react to it, how the wind would react to it, we can use, uh, 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 let's say, fans and detect the airflow through ammonometers. We can uh, check the lux situation. Always a physical model can give lots of data, especially if you are working comparatively, because the physical model is not really going to give you the exact numbers, but, but you can create two, three physical models, create a comparison. And it can give you very good results that can help through concept design phases. Uh, this is an example that I did in the, uh, an exhibition in which other 15 students did participate to support me. In which, we, as you see here, we tried the different geometries of these uh, conical shapes. And after there was the three fans, and uh, we called this cool spots. And we were investigating with an I investigated with an individuals how these different geometries lead to changes in the speed and uh, homogeneity, continuity of airflow. Um, so it was a very interesting experiment. We used plenty of physical models to to see how a specific facade, specific climatic uh, solutions can lead to uh, an inner situation. Uh, uh, physical models with even uh, material, with the natural material, this was a set for an aerodynamic uh, earthen. Now it's, we are mixing with uh, captain 
and the geometry of an F ball like this, uh, multi layered technique of uh, closer to the Catalan. I tried to do something with as multi layered uh, technique of Earth. And all of this was built with very small pieces of Earth uh, to test the, the structural behavior of these. Uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, it's, it's a vault, but it has the geometry to enhance airflow and the openness to enhance airflow. But at the end of the workshop, we always say with all of the intuition, with all of the studies, with all the type of uh, physical models, all the principles that we use, getting back to nature, all of this, we have to always remember that uh, the biclimatic is an element, that it is part of the experience. But it has to always also relate to phenomenology, the whole total experience of the building. I am here using the Sarnaval of, uh, of Peter Zomsor as one of the most clear examples. In because you know Zomsor has been is one of the artists that really focus on atmosphere, right? It's really the starting point for him and materiality, how the material, the light, can create an atmospheric condition. And and I always remind the students really by climatic has to become a source for a beautiful atmosphere, a very special atmosphere. And it could be a very special way to do atmospheric architecture because imagine the atmosphere of the hot and dry, which is very enclosed like this, very enclosed, very heavy, versus the atmospheric conditions of some of the warm and humid, warm and humid, which is very light, right? Imagine a light structure with open panels, uh, light panels like Japanese architecture in hot, uh, warm and humid, and then uh, a heavy earthen architecture uh, in heavy walls, with very small openings in hot and dry. So you'll find both could lead to very different atmosphere. One with wood, another one with one roof with earth, another or stone, another with wood. And, and you can imagine that the, the, the climatic conditions could lead to very versatile atmosphere. And if you search from beginning, thinking what kind of atmosphere, what kind of vibe, what kind of thing uh, that would suit most this climate, how to use the climate to create a very special atmosphere to emphasize the lightness, to emphasize the heaviness, to emphasize the closeness, to emphasize the openness. and, and uh, yeah, uh, so I hope this is very integral to the process. Uh, so we, it's a process of integration. It's, uh, you integrate the analytical to the numerical, uh, and sorry, the analytical to intuitive, and the atmospheric to the to the climatic. At the end of the day, biclimatic architecture is just good architecture. If it is good architecture, it has to be biclimatic. Yeah, thank you. With that, I conclude. Thank you very much, Omar, for that extremely interesting and engaging presentation. Um, we shall now open the forum for questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. I am um, here in the Dominican Republic. I was thinking about um, the observation of nature and also the idea of being inspired by vernacular architecture. <clears throat> I feel that here we have um, a little uh, cultural barrier uh, to that because, well, of course, because of uh, many years of colonization of the island and also a lot of different cultures. But um, I've been like uh, studying a little bit of uh, vernacular architecture and uh, I see that uh, there is this, um, like a refusal of these elements, you know, like there's less and less people knowing how to build um, roofs with uh, uh, palm leaves and uh, because there's no demand for it. So I don't know if you guys have this this kind of issue in, in India, but um, um, yeah. how, how would you maybe um, yeah. uh, talk I, about this? I can take this. Uh, no, uh, from, from my practice, it's not only in, uh, in, uh, in any country, it's in every country. And uh, the reason is very simple. When you investigate and, and Hassan Fakhi went through the process, 
uh, he was the one calling for the vernacular approach and he went to Egypt and his architecture was refused everywhere because it's a class issue. They see in many places that the modern represents this class. You will find those who are in villages. They feel like we, they want the slab, the, the straight slab of the reinforced concrete, and they want to be able to expand up, up and up and up. And so they want the capacity of the material, what it offers to spaces, but at the same time, they, it for them represents moving from this class to the class of the more educated in the city, right? So, so uh, and it's very difficult to go to them and say, no, 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 no. remain and do your own ways. And, and I never called to do vernacular architecture. Vernacular architecture is very specific to specific society. We have to also understand vernacular architecture comes when there is a society of a specific homogeneity, right? The whole society has the same tradition of building architecture. They build in the same way. They know how to do it. They have the same technique. They develop together. They work together. And there is very little space for individualism. So we are not, I'm not calling at all to, to, re, to go to two steps and to do like vernacular. I'm, I'm calling for inspiration from vernacular solutions to do it through modern means. And it's not necessarily that anybody gonna, is going to receive it, uh, the client or the user, they don't have to receive it as, wow, this is vernacular. This is for you. This is for you. You have used the technique of the roof because it helps with the airflow. That's it. And and uh, and it how is how it looks like it can look as modern as it as it looks. It can look contemporary. It can look futuristic. It doesn't. It does. It's. I'm not talking of a vernacular character. I'm talking of vernacular solutions. If vernacular found solutions to be in harmony with nature, you do architecture that it is in harmony with nature. Uh, now, uh, uh, that doesn't mean it has to feel vernacular. Now, when it comes to material like a thatch roof, for example, uh, very interesting. I'll give you a very interesting example. Uh, thatch roofs exist here in our area in Tamil it has been repeatedly used through history. And you find it very rarely used now. Why? Because if you use a thatch roof now, you have to change it every short, very short time. Why? Because the quality of the craft has completely descended. It used to be very, very, very accurately made thatch roof. Today, you cannot have this. So it's very really difficult to go to tell the people do thatch roofs, but then you find them today using more industrial uh, products like, let's say, corrugated metal sheets or other type, specific type of tiles or whatever, whatever material. But that doesn't mean that you can learn something from the thatch roof its angle, how it deals with the sun and how it deals with the wind and how it deals with the, with the rain, but adjust it to the new technology. A very good example to see uh, would be the architecture of Glen Market in hot and humid climate in Australia, in which he used some of these angled roofs with very beautiful geometry to attract a flow to use the to get the the rain. But of course, you cannot win, and as you have to also learn when you use a new technology, you know how to use the vernacular but adapt it to the new technology. For example, the thatch roof geometry will be angled will be like this, right? Why? Because you need rain to float very quickly. If the rain moves very slow on the fast roof, it goes down, right? It filters and it goes inside the space. But when you use corrugated metal sheets, why you do this? You can do this, right? So it gives you a little bit more advantages that can help you with other aspects of design. And also there are corrugated metal sheets with layer of insulation, with a layer of a uh, 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 surface that uh, radiates uh, uh, solar radiation, there are several solutions. So it's not a call for vernacular, it's a call for vernacular way of thinking, vernacular relation to nature, 
vernacular processes whenever possible, some of it, and vernacular uh, solutions. At the end, aesthetically and how it feels like, I'm not at all into buildings that is nostalgic. I'm not into nostalgia, I'm into solutions that works. I hope that was clear. Thank you. Yes. I have a question, Omar. In general, how do you see yeah. this, um, like concepts of like bioclimatic earth, uh, these applications, uh, you know, permeating globally or in general the architecture that is being done today? Do you think it's you know we're very far from it? Do you think it's being somehow taken by the architecture community or there is a small community thinking in this direction how do you see it how do you see the future of it or the present of it well, uh, is it there it's everywhere uh, everybody is saying i'm doing but i'm doing green i'm doing uh, uh sustainable everybody but the problem is that in many cases it's, uh, 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 more mar marketing than real, that's the main problem. So it, it does exist, uh, too. it does exist more than it really exists, that's the main problem. It's not, that the, it's not that it has no market, actually, it does have huge market. Like today you have many real estate developers coming and asking for bioclimatic everywhere. And, and the many, many, uh, I know some of them, and uh, Many, many of the clients come and ask for bioclimatic and earth architecture. No, I think it's gradually the consciousness is moving towards more sustainable, maybe not fast enough. But what is to me really dangerous is uh, some people call it greenwashing. I don't know that uh, the term. When there are many companies claiming that they are doing something green, something bioclimatic. And again, they make the tree above the building and they make the uh, wind uh, above the building and the uh, photovoltaic and something looks like it is really green or by but it's not. It's not the right proportion, it's not the right study for the wind, it's not the right solar radiation study, it's not the wind to solar radiation, it's not the right selection of material. It's not a it's core by climatic. Uh, but I am optimistic a bit because there are many, I find again and again in many schools, uh, it becomes more an integral part of teaching and uh, gradually and, uh, and uh, in many good schools and, and, uh, and uh, maybe, maybe, maybe we will see more uh, uh, authentic in the future. There are still few very authentic artists, some authentic artists who work on these principles, and I think the number is increasing. Yeah. Thank you. The floor yeah. continues to be open for questions. Hi, Omar. This is Julia. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I, well, I do have a million uh, questions not formulated yet. <laughs> We start uh, with one of them. Yeah. No, <laughs> just, just a silly comment. But I wanted to ask about. Um, I was really interested in the in the point where you mentioned the eucalyptus tree as having this sort of. Um, oh, come can you can you repeat slowly? You are interested in. Yeah. But I was really interested in the point where you mentioned the eucalyptus tree, having this sort of camouflage skin where it becomes whiter. Uh -huh summer and darker in the winter yeah. with temperature and I uh, was wondering if you had uh, examples of how that has been implemented in in architecture uh, how this has been implemented in architecture um, do you know of any building that completely changed it geometry from uh, or its surface from one season to another like for example if you go to uh, the, the, the very traditional architecture of uh, a society an old uh, native american society called haida 
and they had these uh, their their buildings in uh, in what is in Canada today, in uh, what is called what is Vancouver basically today, and they have these very stretched long buildings. But interestingly, the building because it's a colder climate is not. A house for one person it's a community house for a whole clan and they have the structure in which it is fully covered and inside there is are the houses of all the members of the clan and the fire pit in which they do the dance yeah of course uh, 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 as you ima uh, we always imagine that Native Americans, uh, what we call mistakenly, uh, very accurately, Red Indians, but uh, Native Americans uh, had uh, only live in this uh, shape of a of a of a tent like, which is the city house. Absolutely inaccurate. It's almost the American movie version, but they lived in all kinds of. Uh, uh, diverse cities, and uh, and uh, probably as somebody who lives in South America will be more aware of this. Very bustling and very dense cities in some cases. But this is was a type that lived in the north, one of the earliest uh, societies, Native American societies, because you know Native Americans came traveling from crossing from Russia originally. So this is the 10,000 BCE society. And they adapted to the conditions of Canada uh, by having this community building. And the fire pit is inside the house, inside that big community building. And there are another fire pit in front of each single house. Now, it is fully covered and creates a very warm environment during the cold time. And they live together, they dance together, they generate heat together, they cook together all in this covered place. But in the summer, there is the possibility to take all of this out and and keep the houses uh, separate, uncovered. So so if you look at this building, the, at this type of a building, it looks almost like a eucalyptus tree, right? In the summer, it has a very specific shape, very porous, very open. Only you see the separate buildings and the open fire. In the winter, it is all covered. You don't see the separate and individual houses, and the fire pit is all inside. And uh, and it's one example of how a building completely can take a very different shape from summer to winter. This is only on the top of my head. Uh, Definitely, that's any... a great example. What? Definitely, what? that's a great example. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, 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 any house with movable eaves, for example, in which in one season it is really closed, in another season. But that's, I think, the hyena example. If you check it, uh, it's a very, it's a very clear example of of this. A building completely transformed from one season to another. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And what kind of um, implementations in contemporary architecture of that sort could we find? Implementation of contemporary architecture. Um, not with, for me, not with the same clarity, but definitely there have been many buildings that are designed, for example, with shutters, right? You know the night shutters, in which in which at night they are fully closed, in the in the day they are fully open, right? So you find a big change from day to night. Uh, uh, you will find it's actually happening very spontaneously. You will find many of the houses that have very movable, uh, like the, the the modern the modern houses all in Cairo has what we call shish, these movable uh, wooden panel panels that you can change. You can open halfway, one quarter of the way, the total way. And you will find the buildings really changing from winter to summer because in winter during the day time they want sun they open and and in in, in 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 the summer it's really closed and you only get very little light from these spaces from the window 
So, I mean, it's as simple as if you make a window with two or three layers adaptable, you will find naturally the building is changing its shape because the people are naturally changing the way they are using the, the, the building. So you just need to offer this opportunity of fenestrations that has the capacity to change with the climate, for example. This is at its most simple example, which in many cases, the most simple is the most successful. Of course, the, you can find buildings in Dubai in which it is all automatically moving and, 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 and based on my own understanding of things, Rarely these kind of things work it needs because all of these uh, uh, computer computer driven techniques to control has many many issues, but I trust more the nineteenth uh, uh, century engineering basically <laughs> things that move like this like this offer people the simple opportunities they could really work. Because today I feel that architecture, I don't know if, I mean, there's a mix between civil engineering and architecture, of course, but I, I feel there is um, a lot of, um, uh, like a very uh, optimistic, uh, I don't know, like feeling about what technology or digital technology can do for the way we live. And, and somehow I'm still not a big fan of it. I'm, I'm very analog in that sense um for example this, this example you you gave of i guess it's like what you call the volet right from le volet en france right? like it's, um, yeah. yeah i never thought about it that way but it, when i used to live in paris it is true that it was something very useful to deal with the climate something as straightforward as this right right yeah indeed but today i feel there is a lot of um just too much um like optimism on what digital technology is gonna do for us, you know, and now we have like digital houses and all of this like e-houses and sort of stuff, which I'm not fond of it at all in any shape or form. And and I think it's gonna flop. <laughs> well, I, 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 there is always uh, some examples of these buildings on the edge of technology that are very promising and can lead to some interesting results, of course. And we have to always experiment, but at the same time, we have to be careful because many of them uh, are not really, are not necessarily offering uh, uh, practical, uh, durable solutions to be used by the people, but they are um, in many cases coming from the need of the architect or the need of the engineer to uh, claim I made something new, right? And, uh, and it's this, this, Somehow it's this civilization because it's very related to, especially today with the neoliberal economy, right? You always need to produce a new product to sell, right? And, and we have to be careful because the nature of the economy really encourages this. It's always original, it's always new, uh, but sometimes building on previous solutions that proven to work and tweaking it a little bit, modifying it a little bit, modernizing it a little bit, advancing it a little bit, could be very efficient. And and uh, and uh, I think that doesn't. This is not a statement against innovation, but uh, it's a statement for continuity. Let's say it's a statement for continuity of solution while innovating instead of always something that it is purely original, which is not always working, but in some cases needed but we have to be careful with it at least do not allow this sense of originality uh, the need to have something original idea original concept at least make sure that doesn't stop us from building on the ideas that has proven to us yeah. and maintain this continuity and advance evolving instead of bringing something out of nothing in some cases you have yeah. to be careful especially because the economy is pushing for it yeah. so you have to be careful as designers yeah. Yeah. yeah yes yes okay good yeah great perfect okay thank you everybody who came today yeah. everybody who joined us yesterday and well this concludes the uh, webinar introduction to earth and architecture with the Auroville earth institute thank you everybody okay. thank you thank you yeah bye bye bye, bye. bye. thank you